to the media and there's a broader interest. So that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Please share um, your screen and, and you can start your presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to share my screen now. Right. Can you see a PDF file? Yeah. Okay. Yes, so yeah, can. Uh, we'll and enter we full screen. Well. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Davi, everyone. Again, um, thank you again for Christina and, and Ben Jones for having invited me to, to come here to be able to share this, uh, our results. So um, as I said, I'm a PhD student in Hamburg. Um, and the overarching goal of my PhD is to develop a empirical model for coastal erosion um, and to have it implemented in the Max Planck Institute Earth System model so that we can better assess the, the interplay between Arctic coastal erosion and the Earth's climate. And yeah, and my project is funded by Muna Tariuk. Um, yeah, so this is a, a EU Horizon 2020 program funded project. It was funded for five years, if I'm not so wrong. And it's very broad in terms of disciplines. So there are, uh, I think, nine or 10 work packages and they cover uh, physical disciplines. So there's a lot of field work going on there. Um, there's also social sciences. Um, people go to the Arctic and they interview, they talk to uh, coastal communities and and there's also a modeling working package, which is the one I, I, I participate. So I don't go to the field, actually. I mean, I had a chance to go last year, um, but I, I mean, I'm not really a, a field scientist. I'm more on the modeling side. So it's a very uh, broad project. You can, you can Google more. I mean, you can, the, the, the site is Nina Tariuk, as it's spelled here, dot org. So it's a nice website. There's a lot of information there. Um, yeah, so if I just start um oh me too okay i need to find out find out how to change the slides sorry <laughs> uh -huh. okay for some reason slides don't move oh yeah there you go okay okay so a, a short introduction on on uh what article erosion is maybe it's a bit um Okay, this is very short. So there's this nice picture from uh, Michael Fritz, uh, where he uh, depicts the nice processes that are associated with coastal erosion. So here you have the polygonal tundra, you have permafrost uh, thawing that's increasing temperatures, you have sea ice free conditions that allow waves to reach the shore, and then you have here coastal erosion taking place. Um, yeah, and and this eroded material, it's very rich in organic carbon, right? So it's, it's estimated that about 14 teragrams of organic carbon are released every year due to coastal erosion. Um, maybe you know better, but maybe, so this is in the same order of magnitude from, as if, if you compare it to uh, riverine discharge. So it's substantial. And this organic matter uh, can take different degradation pathways, right? So it can be transported to other regions in the ocean. It can um, be buried in the near shore sediment. It can boost primary production or it can end up in, in the atmosphere CO2. And when it does, um, it potentially contributes to further warming. Um, uh, and this further warming also contributing to further for, uh, coast, coastal erosion. And so you can see coastal erosion as a, a positive feedback loop in the climate system, which hasn't been uh, objectively quantified yet. yet. Uh, and there's this other aspect of coastal erosion that is that it causes um, uh, infrastructure damage, therefore a threat to to local communities. Uh, now, how big is this problem? Um, the Arctic coast uh, represents about uh, one third of the entire Arctic, uh, entire world's coastline, and the Arctic coastline is retreating, is eroding at a rate of about half a meter per year, on average. Uh, but there's a, a, a large um, spatial and temporal variability to this number. So if we look at this figure, we see here in red colors where we have um, the larger rates of coastal erosion, mean rates of coastal erosion. So they're located like around the, the Beaufort Sea here in, in Alaska, also in the, 
um, here around in close to the east, uh, in the East Siberian and Laptev Seas. And in these places, coastal erosion can be as large as 22 or 25 meters in one year. Um, but it has been also reported uh, by, by Ben Jobs, for example, that the uh, coastal erosion rates are increasing in magnitude and uniformity. And this could be related to um, increasing surface temperatures that um, favor permafrostal and uh, sea ice loss, and, and therefore increasing the duration of the open water season. And I have to highlight here that the, the duration of the open water season um, is, is, is uh, the first order estimator, or if a good first order proxy for um, coastal erosion variability, right? Because coastal erosion can only take place when there is no sea ice, right? Uh -huh. Slides change. Yeah, okay. So, um, so the, first, the open water season duration is the a first um, order driver, but within the open water season, there are different uh, physical mechanisms that take place. So you have here thermal denudation, TD, that would represent the thermal component of coastal erosion. Uh, so it's, it's depicted here as the, the thawing of the top of the cliffs. So the, the permafrost thaws at the top and then it just falls, destabilizes and falls apart here falls down and accumulates here on the beach. And then you also have thermal abrasion, which is a, a combination of the mechanical and thermal components, but more from the ocean side. So you have the warm ocean of temperatures thawing the subsea permafrost and, and the, the kinetic uh, energy of waves come and, and cause this abrasion at the bottom of the cliffs and then open these notches. And then when these notches go deep enough, you have an aerial view uh, of the polygons again and the nice wedges. When these, these notches go too deep, um, entire blocks of still frozen material roll and they normally break at the ice wedges and they uh, fall on the beach, right? And then they are then eventually uh, washed away by ocean waves and, and currents, especially during uh, storm events. Uh, so now for us to model these processes, we would need a, a, a relatively high, uh, high resolved model, relatively if you compare to the, to the current Earth system models we have, we have nowadays. So we just don't have that resolution of order of meters uh, or in Earth system models. So um, it's not really feasible to, to model this uh, in, in a process-based manner. So that's why it's interesting to look for large-scale drivers that drive, that drive coastal erosion. Um, yeah, so that's exactly the question that we pose ourselves. Um, can we link coastal erosion rates or variability to, to larger scale um, climate variability? So to do that, we, we took a, a, a very sp um, special data set that was shared with us by Mikhail Grigoryev from the Medical Permafrost Institute in Russia. Um, so his father actually started measuring coastal erosion in the early 50s. And then Mikhail took over in 1982. And since then, he's been uh, going to these places and, and measuring coastal erosion almost every year. Um, so we have a very unique data set in, in the sense that it's very long and, and timely result. Um, his uh, measuring uh, uh, technique or equipment is, is not uh, very fancy. So you can see here's like a, a fixed uh, point in the ground. And then he would go there every year to, to to measure the distance between this fixed point and uh, um, the shoreline. And um, yeah, so the difference between two yearly measurements will give you the, the coastal erosion rate of that year. Um, yeah, so these places that we're taking the data from, they are Bikovsky Peninsula and Mostak Island. They're located just next to the um, uh, Lena River Delta here in the, in the Laptev Sea. And this is a region where you would normally have full sea ice concentration during winter. Uh, so here I show you the climatology of, of winter sea ice concentration in the Laptev Sea and the surface wind. So when I, when I say winter here, I, I'm referring to February, March, and April. So I would say um, FMA from now on. Um, yeah, so full sea ice concentration in winter, but there is some variability to it. Here in, in the red contours, I'm showing you um, the standard deviation of this mean. So you can see that the, the, the winter sea ice concentration variability is, is located more here uh, along the, the coast in the lab type C. Also close to the Lena, uh, Lena uh, Delta here. Um, so what we did next, uh, we took these data 
and we did a simple um, statistical analysis. We did a, a principal component analysis to, to, to separate the main modes of, um, the, of, of variability of, of the coastal erosion data. And then we tried to match these main modes of variability with um, plausible large scale physical mechanisms. Okay, um, I hope you can still hear me. Um, all right. So before I, I, I show you the these principal components, I would like to yeah to highlight the role of of winter sea ice. Right. So here we have uh, there's this nice paper from Itkin and Krumpen, 2017, where they did a couple of sensitivity experiments with models focusing on lapt FC and on sea ice. So they, they, they were showing the years in which you had um, high sea ice export during winter, right? So here shown in, in the, the red curves, those winters would be followed by um, summers with below average sea ice concentration, right? And vice versa. And, and also that the years with high sea ice export would um, be followed by a early onset of the open water season. So here you can see uh, two years that were extreme in terms of winter uh, sea ice export from the left FC and they, they differ substantially on, on the dates of the, the start of the retreat of the sea ice, right? So yeah, so we, if we, so, so winter sea ice would be related to, to coastal erosion via then the modulation of the open water season duration, which is uh, probably a primary driver for coastal erosion right, at this point. Um, okay, so so what we did now we took the, the time series of coastal erosion rates from 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 the from the measurements, and if we correlate them with um, monthly lab tev CIS concentration, so monthly LSIC, uh, we get maximum correlation correlation coefficients in winter here in FMA, and yeah, significant in FMA. So so this is a first indication that um, uh, correlate the 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 the, the winter sea ice concentration could be related to coastal erosion variability in a way. Um, so here we, we suggest that um, our PC1, so the first principal component from our coastal erosion data is uh, linked uh, or is an imprint from, from the winter uh, laptop sea ice concentration anomalies. Um, so here I, I plot the two time series, sea ice is inverted just to better uh, visually match. Um, and yeah, so correlation between the two time series is about 0.68. And this first principal component explains more or less half of the total variance of the coastal erosion data. Uh, and you can see here that there's a, a, a um, low frequency variability, if you like, in these, in these curves. So if we do a frequency analysis here, we, we, we see that the predominant frequency in this data set in, the, in, the, in winter sea ice concentration in the lab sea has a, a frequency that is corresponding to a period of about 19 years, 19 to 20 years. There's also a higher frequency here, but if you want to highlight this low frequency variability, we can apply a low pass filter to this time series and then correlation increase to uh, up to 0.81. Um, now, if you want to do this frequency analysis, not only in the laptop C um, area average winter sea ice, but in, in the Arctic in general, um, we can see that this decadal scale uh, variability of, of, of winter sea ice is not, is not a localized feature of, of, of our data, but it's, it's actually predominant over large areas here in the East Siberian and also in the Laptev Seas. Um, uh, so here you see in green colors the, 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 the periods that are between 15 and 20 years, right? So in the decadal range. So the idea here is that the PC1, so the first mode of variability from our coastal erosion rates, um, is, a, is a signature from a, a large scale mode of, of, of climate variability that can also be visible in, in winter sea ice uh, concentration anomalies in a large area here. Now we link our second principal component of the coastal erosion data with the Arctic oscillation, the AO. And the uh, Arctic oscillation is, um, so a short definition is, is defined as the first EOF or the first empirical orthogonal function of sea level pressure over the Northern hemisphere, everything North from 20 degrees North. And it can be understood as a, a, a 
for is the first mode of variability of um, atmospheric mass balance between uh, high and, and low latitudes. And it is, it's known for having an influence on, on weather, uh, specifically on intensity and frequency of storms, especially during winter. So you can see here that the Arctic Oscillation is more pr uh, prominent during winter, but it is also defined during summer. So here we're calling summer JJA, June, July, August. And uh, I want you to note, please, that uh, the polar, ac polar center of action of the Arctic Oscillation during summer is is, is more constrained here over Greenland and over the polar ocean. Uh, so it's smaller in size. Now, if we do a composite difference analysis from our uh, PC2 time series, that is we take the years of high PC2 values um, and the years of low PC2 values and we do um, high minus low and the average of that, of sea level pressure and uh, geopotential height at 200 hectopascal, um, we get a, some spa spatial patterns that are very much similar to the spatial patterns of the Arctic Oscillation. And uh, you can just note also that the spatial pattern that we get here in summer has a inverted sign, more or less, with, with, the, with the Arctic Oscillation pattern, right? So this is a, like, a suggestion, an indication that there, there has something uh, between the PC2 and the Arctic Oscillation in these two seasons. Uh, so here I show you the, the time series of the Arctic Oscillation indices in winter and summer and, and our PC2 time series in blue. Um, yeah, so correlations are, they quantitatively agree with the patterns that I showed you. They're not extremely high, no, right? But um, we're comparing here the second component of, or, or, of, of our coastal erosion data with the Arctic Oscillation that is defined literally at, a, at, a, at a, a planetary scale, right? So there has to be a chain of mechanisms in between, if, if anything, to, 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 to explain this linkage. And yeah, and the scales are just very different. So um, um, yeah, I was not so sad that correlations were not so high. Yeah, th th that was my point. So we are saying here that PC2 is, is related to the winter Arctic Oscillation in its positive phase and with the summer Arctic Oscillation in its negative phase, right? Correlation with the summer AO is negative. Uh, okay, so now what's the mechanism behind that I want to propose to propose, suggest a mechanism to, to back up this link. So the Arctic Oscillation during winter is already known for for driving sea ice variability. So the, the winter AO has this characteristic uh, cyclonic um, gyre here. Oh, sorry. And, and, and it drives, uh, it pushes, it vacs sea ice out of the Laptev Sea here and through the Fram Strait. This was shown early in, in, by Rigord in 2002. And this, this advection or pushing of sea ice out of the Laptev Sea during winter by the Arctic Oscillation would um, open polinias and, and floor leads in the Laptev Sea also um, and therefore enhance the, 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 the heat fluxes from ocean to atmosphere and, and also contribute to the formation of new, thin, fragile sea ice that would uh, melt easier and also um, anticipate the onset of the open water season. So if we just repeat this analysis now, uh, we, if we, we regress, we can do a, a regress the, the Arctic Oscillation, the winter Arctic Oscillation index on sea ice, concentration anomalies and surface wind. We get this same characteristic pattern. We get this um, surface, surface winds blowing from the south, leading to this um, negative, this, this area of negative sea ice concentration anomalies, mainly along the coast. Um, which is what uh, Rigor has, uh, had already shown before. Uh, and if we do the, uh, the, this composite difference analysis again, so we take our, our PC2 uh, strong minus uh, weak years and we do the, the same anomalies, uh, we get a pattern that is um, qualitatively similar again. So we get the, the wind, surface winds blowing from the south mainly and the negative sea ice concentration anomalies spread mainly along the coast here in the Laptev Sea. And um, it's also interesting to know that the Arctic Oscillation, um, also it's not an oscillation in, in, in it that it, it's not something that repeats itself uh, uh, with a fixed period of time, but, um, um, but you can al analyze the most uh, predominant frequencies of these time series. And when you, get, when you do that, we, you get frequencies that are corresponded to periods that are no longer than uh, four or maybe six years, right? The, the most significant period here has about four years. 
So it has a higher, higher frequency variability in comparison to the first PC that we saw that had this uh, decadal scale um, uh, frequency, this decadal uh, scale variability, right? So the mechanism in, uh, behind the winter AO would also be related to um, the variability of uh, the AO driving variability of winter CIs, therefore the duration of the open water season, but with a, with a higher frequency uh, with respect to, to the first PC. Now during summer, the mechanism is, is different. Um, so Ding and, and co-authors in 2017, they showed that this um, anticyclonic uh, atmospheric circulation here that is centered over Greenland and also the polar, uh, the, the Arctic Ocean, uh, which are the very features of the, the, the polar center of action of the summer AO that I showed you before. Um, so this anomalous circulation is linked to decrease in sea ice concentration uh, or sea ice cover uh, in the Arctic in general. And the mechanism behind that would be that um, this anticyclonic gyre. So here I'm showing you now, oh, if you see my pointer, this is a, a vertical section of the zonal means. So, uh, so this anticyclonic gyre would be responsible for, uh, so, so coupled to a, a, a diabatic descent and this de air mass uh, descending and this descent is shown here in the red contours and this descent would cause a surface warming shown here in the, the yellow colors here at the surface uh, and then in black you see geopotential height contours also increasing with latitude uh, and this surface warming would then um, lead to the decrease of sea ice cover this is what, what they focus on in their paper uh, and, and but could also um, this surface warming could also lead to uh, potentially um, uh, increased permafrost thaw, for example. So that's the link. So we um, the, a change in circulation associated with the summer Arctic oscillation could contribute to further permafrost thaw and decreasing sea ice cover, which uh, could then um, increase the fetch for waves and then contribute to thermal to thermal abrasion as well. So in both both ways. And this thermal and this um, surface warming would also be visible in, 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 in different fields. So for example, in, in the surface downward long wave radiation, right? So, we, and, and that uh, downward long wave radiation will be responsible for thawing from frost and melting sea ice. And if you do a regression, if you regress the, the, the AO in the summer AO index onto, onto this field to get you get the, the, the pattern that we would expect, so a significant increase in downward long wave radiation. And the analysis of our PC2 shows again qualitatively uh, the same, so anomalies in the, in the same sign. Uh, so now if we take these three mechanisms, um, so the winter laptop sea ice concentration anomalies, uh, the winter Arctic oscillation index and the summer Arctic oscillation index and combine these time series in in multiple linear regression models to explain the variability of the time series of coastal erosion rates. We explain something between 20 and 53% of the, sorry, time variance. Um, yeah, and, and this difference between um, the, the three locations um, could have several reasons. One of them is that we didn't take into consideration um, any local characteristics, right? So, and these places differ um, slightly at least on, on, for example, ground ice content, uh, bathymetry profile, cliff height, orientation of the coastline, and, and so on and so on. And, and here we're not, we're not going there. So we're just really looking at the large scale climate variability and how can they, how can they explain the, the time variability of our coastal erosion rates. Um, so we cannot explain coastal erosion values at specific years. Um, yeah, but, but we, we can say here that we can see that the, our model in, in our coastal erosion, our linear regression model in red here, and, and, and the observations in blue, you can see the observations are almost always within the uncertainty range of the models. Our model cannot just take, cannot explain very well also the very extreme values um, sometimes. And so we cannot really get the, the specific values, right? But like the decadal scale trends or, or interannual trends are represented by this combination of variables. Yeah, um, so to summarize, hopefully I could uh, show you that 
uh, we can link Article Cellular Origin um, to large scale climate variability. And that is especially interesting for us because, um, yeah, so our, our system models can better represent this, this scale of variability um, uh, rather than, than very small uh, features that, yeah, for example, coastal erosion. And uh, so we separated the main modes of coastal erosion and we linked the, the main mode, the, the first principal component to uh, low frequency. So the decadal scale changes in winter sea ice concentration and that would modulate the duration of the open water season. So this comes to actually confirm the, the leading role that the duration of the open water season has on um, driving the variability of coastal erosion. And RPC2 is then linked to the Arctic oscillation with a higher frequency. And during winter, it will, it will have a similar mechanism. And if you compare it to PC1, so also driving variability of winter sea ice, therefore duration of the open water season. And during summer, the mechanism is, a, is, is via atmospheric circulation changes that lead to surface warming, therefore permafrost flow, and um, sea ice melting, therefore contributing to coastal erosion via thermal abrasion and denudation. Now, if I show you just one more slide uh, on, on what I'm working on now. Um, so we were speaking, we were talking about um, uh, time variability of coastal erosion in one very specific place in the Arctic in the Laptev Sea. So now um, we, we, we're trying to make a, 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 we're trying to explain the spatial variability of coastal erosion, but we, we don't have, um, unfortunately, that many time series of coastal erosion in, all over the Arctic, but we do have uh, estimations, estimations of coastal erosion mean rates or long-term mean rates of coastal erosion for, for almost the entire Arctic. So we're working with this uh, database called the Arctic a Coastal Dynamics Database from, from Uglantui and, and, and Polo Verduin. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, we have here at the coastal segment level, we have more than 1,300 coastal segments and they have information such as uh, ground ice content, um, carbon content, the estimation of the long-term coastal erosion rate, and they have uh, data quality flags. So you can take, you can cluster these segments in different ways. You can uh, take different subsets of them. And we're comparing the segments with a reanalysis product. So here I show you, for example, the ETA 20C and ETA 5 reanalysis. And again, I'm here just showing you here the, the outline of the, the Lena River Delta. And just, just, for, just to show you how the, the resolutions change. So we, we try, uh, kind of everything, uh, uh, different resolutions. We can take averages of different variables over different number of rows of grid cells close to the coastal segment. So we're testing wave heights, surface winds, positive degree days. And uh, so now what we get for now is, is the following. So here on the x-axis, you don't have time anymore. We have coastal segments, right? Because we, we explain, and, and so, right, so the blue curve here is is the observed or estimated coastal erosion mean rate, mean and time, right? So each point here is a place, a coastal segment, and our model here explains the spatial variability. And yeah, yeah, with, with different combination of variables, this is the best we can do so far. With a very small subset of coastal segments, we explain about 43, so a bit less than half of the spatial variance of, of, of coastal erosion mean rates. Uh, but this is really still ongoing work. Um, yeah, so thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm happy to take uh, questions and comments. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. We do have time for questions. I will ask a question if no one else has one right now. Please yeah. also feel free to type in a question into the chat box. Uh, I don't know if this is a dumb question or if I didn't pay enough attention, but does El Nino, yeah. La Nina years have any impact on coastal erosion? Is that something that's included in any of your analysis? Okay. Um, right. Okay. So no, no, I haven't really thought about that actually. No, but that, that's a good point. Um, so we were thinking, when we were thinking large scale, we were um, thinking Arctic oscillation as very, very large already, but yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't considered La Nina and El Nino. Um, I don't know if it matters so much for that, uh, but here in Arizona, and El Nino and right. La Nina here has a huge impact, so that's why it's on yeah, my yeah. mind. And I, I was just curious if that's something to consider. I mean, there are, there are tiny connections, right? I mean, El Nino and La Nina has effects um, maybe everywhere on the globe in different ways, um, different variables. So 
um, yeah, I mean, I shouldn't rule out the effect of El Nino and La Nina, but, but uh, I haven't looked at that, no, yeah. Okay. And th there's no dumb questions, no, yeah. <laughs> please. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, David, this is Ben. Hi, yeah. Hey, great presentation. Um, so a question about your, uh, this ongoing work slide. Yeah. Are you looking at all, um, are you looking at all at data sets on the terrestrial side of things in terms of um, kind of rates of permafrost, temperature warming across this area and or um, some of the characteristics of the landscape in terms of ice wedge, ice wedge polygon dimensions and um, things like that? Uh -huh. so, so we're looking at, at the, uh, so since we're going, we're trying to make a, a like general model for, for the spatial variability of coastal erosion, we, we're limited on, on data that we have at this scale, right? And data that are kind of harmonized. Uh, so this data set was, was, was like the, the best thing we could use uh, for this matter. So, uh, so we have some information in this, data, in, in this database. Um, uh, we have um, cliff height. We have, so we have as a backshore elevation, we have ground ice content, um, and this is macro and also intra-sedimentary ground, ground ice all, all together, so they don't make distinction between uh, ice wedges and, and, and ice that is not in ice wedges. Uh, we have distances to, to uh, uh, isobaths, so uh, also information on the bathymetry. Um, yeah, but, but I can tell you that this information um, did not help much in improve uh, the, the, the explanation of the spatial uh, differences. What we found that was um, 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 most useful in the sense or from the, from the ge geological point of view was, was uh, or the, the, yeah, the constitution of the gold segments was a ground ice, right? So it's, it's not new that ground ice is positively correlated to coastal erosion. Uh, but all the other um, characteristics that we had available were didn't really seem to, to play a role yet, but yeah, maybe I should include more, more stuff there. Cool, yeah. cool, thanks. Yeah. If you had a, if you could wish for anything, what type of data would you want to improve the modeling? Um, yeah, I mean, time series would be great. <laughs> longer time series. Uh, longer time series, yeah. Um, yeah, because, for example... Are there locations example, that you're missing? Locations where you're like, ah, we just have nothing from here? Right, so, so this, data, this database, this ACD database, it's, it's uh, relatively old. So it was published in 2012. Um, and so I'm working... Years, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, okay, publication... Uh, space of time i don't know yeah but yeah. no but i'm saying that because so um we're working a lot with with um people in in avi also here in germany with paul and 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 he's, he's also working on, on updating me on sending me data that was not yet out by the time of this publication so for example they've done a lot of work on uh, yeah on the lab tfc for example there's a couple, there's a couple of papers on 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 these two specific places like mostak island uh, bukowski peninsula also, his group is working on in, in Alaska and Canada. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of places that are not yet included here, but um, yeah, but the more data, the better, I guess, yes. <laughs> um, would you be interested, um, David, would you be interested in testing some other, some other more local sites for um, kind of the, fir the first part of your presentation? The premise of that, in terms of looking at the large-scale climate drivers. Yes, definitely. Yes, um, it would be interesting to see if that still holds for, uh, for somewhere somewhere very far, for example. Yeah, and we, we, we couldn't do that yet because we, we couldn't put our hands at a time series hmm. like like that one because uh, I mean I, I thought they just didn't exist to be honest. Uh, but um, yeah, but that would be great. Yes. Yeah, Mikhail's data set is definitely unique, but there's Jerry, like Jerry started collecting some data uh, on Nelson Lagoon. Um, Jerry, when did you start doing that if you're still on? I think probably early 2000s, late 1990s. And then- uh, The first observations were way, way back by McCarthy USGS back in the late 1940s. Uh, yeah. We restarted measuring with uh, others uh, 
in the late 90s or mid early 90s uh, when we started the ACD, the Articles of Dynamic Program, which uh, David just showed the last, uh, the compilation of the data from. Uh, but in any event, that the uh, Barrow has one of the longest histories, as you know, Ben, of uh, coastal erosion studies starting from the late 1940s. Mm. Yeah, and since yeah, and since probably about the mid 2000s, Craig Tweedy and his group at Texas El Paso have have taken up the monitoring for that site. So he could be a guy that you might want to try to reach out to for that data. Yeah. Great. Do we have more questions? Meredith, do you want to add anything? Is there something we should mention or? Sure. I will just mention that the um, team, every year there is a team leaders workshop that happens um, where we gather all the team leaders to discuss uh, their plans for the next year. In this case, we're discussing plans for the next six months and that will happen in July and it'll be a virtual meeting. And so Christina, Miriam and Ben, I'm sure if um, if the this team has suggestions on topics that they would like to see, um, I'm sure that the team leaders would welcome those suggestions and can incorporate them into um, the uh, meetings coming up for the next um, until the end of the year. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will also say that this meeting was recorded. I'll post that or that will be posted on the event page. And I guess just stay tuned for other updates from this team. Yeah, I guess there will be no meeting in July, but we plan on resuming in August. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think that, that will, that's probably the case since the team leaders workshop will happen in July. Mm -hmm. Cool, it's four minutes to the end of the hour. It's lunchtime for me, so I'm hungry and don't mind leaving four minutes earlier. If there's anything else you wanna say, please unmute yourself. Otherwise we hope